cats pretty much own the internet. Now, picture a cat photo going viral on Twitter. It is so cute that more and more of your friends, friends of friends are sharing it, and in no time, it's becoming a thing everybody is talking about on the internet. But how does this tweet make its way from one person to another to millions and then hundreds of millions of people? How does Twitter make it happen? Imagine all of that data and numbers processing at a really fast speed. Hi, I'm Priyanka Vargadia, and this is Architecting with Google Cloud. I am so excited to take you on this journey to explore how Twitter does it all. Every day, over 200 million people come to Twitter to find out what's happening in the world and to talk about it. You know, important stuff like the cat pictures. As you can imagine, there is a large amount of data generated when using Twitter in tweeting, retweeting, viewing, or liking a tweet. All this data makes it to the Twitter data center and in Google Cloud. This data is then used by various teams within Twitter to process, analyze, and influence product decisions. So we all can use the service and enjoy its new and improved features every day. Now, Twitter's data platforms are used to improve the service through analytics, understanding, and machine learning improvements. To dig deeper, let's talk tech. How does Twitter's data processing platform work? So the first part of this process is that we built a sophisticated log pipeline system using industry standard applications like Apache, Hadoop, Kafka, and Flume, along with some other aggregation services we built in-house. These services will collect all of this information, aggregate it, and push it out to our internal employees for consumption. Twitter employees run millions of queries a month on almost an exabyte of data stored across tens of thousands of BigQuery tables in Google Cloud. And Twitter's internal data processing jobs process over an exabyte of uncompressed data. So the question becomes, how does the exabyte of data make its way into Google Cloud? Yeah, thanks to the advanced data analytics capabilities of Google Cloud BigQuery, Twitter decided to move a majority of our analytics use cases into Google Cloud and power them with BigQuery. So these are powered by the event logs data, among other data sources. So as you may imagine, Priyanka, we had to build replication services that copy the data from Hadoop distributed file systems, we call it HDFS, and Kafka, in our data centers into Google Cloud. Replicating petabyte scale data from one environment to another is not an easy task. It comes with challenges such as keeping the constantly moving data in sync between the source and the destination, some serious network connectivity challenges, and scrubbing that sensitive data for security. I am definitely curious how Twitter managed to solve these challenges in replicating data from on-premises to Google Cloud. So, uh, Twitter replicates this data in two different ways. One is batch replication and another is streaming replication. So we have a collection of tools and services to replicate this data in batch from HDFS, changing from individual jobs to a platform scale self-service solution. And these jobs and tools they ingest data from HDFS to Google Cloud Storage, and then Google Cloud Storage to BigQuery. Let's discuss about a streaming replication service. So on the streaming replication side, we have a service called Sparrow that uses Kafka, Google PubSub, and BigQuery streaming to lay out data to BigQuery. Once the data is in BigQuery, the employees across different teams use this data to power lots of different use cases. Great, so once this data has made it into BigQuery, how do teams actually use this data? Can you give me some examples of use cases for BigQuery at Twitter? Yeah, so once the use case that we all experience when we land on Twitter homepage is our timeline. The Timelines team creates machine learning models and performs analytics on massive timeline data stored in BigQuery. This is to ensure that we see the best possible tweets on our timelines. 
The other one closer to my heart is abuse detection. BigQuery ML provides anomaly detection capabilities, identifying data and observations that deviate from the common behavior and patterns of our data. But there are lots of other ways to do this. Let's see how the Twitter team handled abuse detection using BigQuery. Great question, Priyanka. So using BigQuery and specifically BQML and SQL queries on top of our data in BigQuery, we can analyze interaction data like replies, content of tweets, and more from all of that data to investigate abusive behavior on the platform. And then using BQML uh, with our own models, we're able to actually analyze those models and validate that they work for abuse detection. Using BigQuery has significantly increased the velocity of investigating these types of issues. We're talking about petabytes of data generated per day, and that needs an easy to manage, scalable storage and analytics system. So how did Twitter manage the storage part of this puzzle? Yeah, this one took us a while to get right. Uh, we ended up creating two different kinds of GCP projects, compute projects and storage projects. And we explicitly ensure that all of our compute related things like data flow jobs or SQL queries run with BigQuery, for example, are run only in compute projects. And separately, we store all of our data for BigQuery in storage projects. BigQuery can process large amounts of data in few seconds because it is very different from the traditional node-based cloud data warehouse solutions. It offers immense scale, flexibility, performance, and cost control by decoupling storage and compute. So what are the main reasons for separating compute and storage in Twitter projects? You know, Priyanka, running compute jobs in compute projects allows each user, for example, an employee, team or an organization to have their own workspace. This facilitates avoiding noisy neighbor problems for BigQuery slot consumption as well as quotas. Then storing data in a separate storage project enables us to avoid strict data compliance standards with respect to data privacy, security, and ultimately protection. When you have a large number of teams consuming the data, you need to plan for scale and efficiency. Getting them access to the data easily is a top priority, and that comes down to organizing the data the right way. Let's find out how Twitter handles organization of data. Great question. So while designing the BigQuery storage structure, we made sure to keep ease of use as a core focus. Uh, we wanted to make sure that our engineering teams, our data scientists, and everybody were able to create BigQuery storage projects and data sets via self-service and configure them anytime. And beyond the event log data that we talked about earlier, we also needed to support data that's owned by service accounts or by employees. Now, tell me more about this identity and access management that's needed to support the self-service access to data. Yeah, so to support the variety of different types of owning entities like I just talked about, uh, for example, those service accounts and individuals, we ended up breaking up our storage projects into different kinds. Uh, we ended up going with one storage project type per owning entity type. So for example, we can have a storage project that's owned by the tweets service account. And in this case, a service account is an identity associated with a given service. So for example, the tweet service account would be used for services that involve tweets. Uh, and teams will typically use a service account for production use cases. Additionally, we can also have a storage project for each individual person, for example, me as a Twitter engineer, and it would contain the data that I produce in my day-to-day -day work in an ad hoc or a development setting. You mentioned event logs. What are they and how do you store them? So the coming back to that event log data that we mentioned earlier, those are gonna be the things that we collect from twitter.com properties. That's going to be things like interactions or faves or those types of things. And we have those streaming into our data centers as we talked about before. But due to the large number of different types of log categories that we have, we decided to consolidate some of those where it makes sense. So instead of having a single log category stored in a storage project, we group them when it makes sense. This helps teams find related log categories in the same projects and keeps unrelated log categories in separate projects. And then to further simplify discovery of these log categories, 
we uh, have a view project that contains one view for each of the backing log category tables. That keeps the, the experience of accessing them consistent with our on-premise solutions. There is a lot happening here. And just so all the configurations are taken care of and the data user can just use the data to do the analysis or use it in their projects right away, I'm curious about the provisioning process for the data stored structure in BigQuery. Absolutely. So we wanted to have our BigQuery storage provisioning processes automated. So our internal customers did not have to remember all bits and pieces of the configuration. Therefore, we built an automation service on GKE that uses infrastructure as code via Terraform configurations. Then we also have source control YAML configuration files that act as source of truth, where employees add their IDs for their service accounts, log names, as well as their user identity. Tell me more about the automation service. What does it do? What happens when the service runs? Yeah, so when the service is triggered by a cloud scheduler job, what it does is it generates a Terraform configurations for new projects, as well as it reconciles the existing projects and resources to maintain compliance with our BigQuery RT. The generated Terraform configuration includes a number of resources and policies like the name of the default dataset, whether it is user or logs, appropriate access control mechanisms like reader and writer group permissions to view and write data to this dataset, and enable essential APIs like BigQuery and BigQuery Data Transfer Service. You know, Priyanka, the privacy and security of data stored in BigQuery is absolutely essential. Therefore, the automation service also secures a project by attaching it to an appropriate VPC service controls parameter. And it then enables organization policies like domain to state sharing. We cannot really talk about data without talking about security and governance. How do you secure and monitor data? So within Twitter, we built a system that monitors all the different data across all of our different storage platforms. That includes things in BigQuery like data sets and tables, along with BigQuery models and other types of things. These services identify the different types of data stored, classifies those pieces of data into different classes, and registers that information in Twitter's internal metadata systems. This includes things like BigQuery data sets and tables, annotations on those tables, annotations on those models, classifications for them, and then setting appropriate retentions for those as well. Now, however you slice it, setting up a data platform is a challenge at any scale, but especially at Twitter scale. Modularity is the key here, separating the storage from compute, which meant creating thousands of Google Cloud projects and data sets. I'm sure you ran into challenges that you had to overcome. Can you go over some of those challenges? So this was especially an important piece of this puzzle. We worked closely with multiple Google Cloud engineering teams to increase the limits beyond normally available thresholds on the platform. Let's take an example. We had to increase the VPC service controls access policies default limit to accommodate several thousands of projects, as you just correctly mentioned. Moreover, to scale our hybrid cloud infrastructure for data processing using BigQuery, we worked with Google Cloud significantly increasing the limits on the number of projects a host VPC, uh, shared VPC project can have. Although we mentioned only two of the most important scalability challenges, we also face challenges in other areas, like the number of BigQuery datasets in a table, the number and size of data load jobs per day in a project, as well as self slot management at this scale, which is a hard problem to solve. The key to building a successful data platform is to keep the customer experience at the core of your tooling, and Twitter implementation proves that. They build a scalable, generic components enabling flexibility in frameworks now and then easier growth in future. Exactly. Using these principles, we were able to build a scalable and easy-to-use system for BigQuery at Twitter. And I must mention that BigQuery at Twitter has seen absolutely explosive adoption rate, and it shows no sign of slowing down. 
no sign of slowing down at all. And big thanks to the Google BigQuery team and Google PSO who work so closely with us to make sure that our framework at Twitter with BigQuery is able to reliably and securely run at our scale. And that's it, folks. Today, we learned how cats run the internet <laughs> and how Twitter designed their next generation data platform using Google Cloud so we can enjoy those cat pictures. If you like this video, go ahead and hit that like button. Share more of your feedback in the comments below.